That's Arthi. That's Noor. And you're listening to The Reality Is. Hey guys, it's just me today riding solo. Just Noor. No Arthi, but I have a guest on the podcast today. Whether you're riding as an M Knight of the Round Table or you have a seat at the lunch table, you know her as the many faces of Ono oh Bravo on Instagram. It's the one and only Chelsea. Hi Chelsea. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm sad that Arthi's not here because she keeps being like, I feel like I've seen her somewhere in public. <laughs> I feel like she cut me off on the highway <laughs> and I'm going to figure it out. We were at Harris Teeter. We fought over a shopping cart. No, we live so close. When I found that out in our DMs, I was like, I, I probably did. And knowing the way that I drive, I'm not the one cutting her off. I'm the one she's like speeding by because I drive like a grandmother these days. And so she's like probably like laying on her horn, like speed up you. <laughs> Yeah, that's a Maryland problem, I have to say, (laughs) as New Jersey. Like, you know it's always somebody from Jersey who's honking at you Mm -hmm. because it's probably me. You guys just love to be in the left lane driving very slowly. I will say I do stay in the right lane. I know my place. I know my station in life. (laughs) Like, I know where I belong. And my husband is always like, because I'll, like, get stuck behind somebody going even slower than me. And I'm the type of person that I'm like, oh, well, like, I'll just, you know, drive. Like, I am not a typical Maryland person. I think it's because my first couple of jobs, I was all over the state doing home visits um, because I work in mental health. And so I just got like used to like, you you just have to surrender and you can't have road rage about it. So I literally Mm. am just like, all of a sudden my husband's like, but can we go around them? Because we're going 30 (laughs) miles per hour. Like, can we possibly get out of this lane? And I'm like, but this is where I belong, the right to hand side. (laughs) All right, Chelsea. Well, I'm really happy you're on the podcast today. We're going to be talking about all of the housewives this week. But before we get into that, I'd love to know who your problematic favorite is on Bravo. So I have some followers that are going to be very pleased that I am acknowledging this problematic fave because they're always in my DMs like, hmm, you're holding some people accountable, but not this one. And it has to do. I love that. With one Lisa Barlow. Oh my God. I love her. I find her chaotic in the best way. I don't think that she knows how wackadoodle she is. Yeah. But the woman voted for Ted Cruz. She did? She did. So my line in the sand, because I had a follower, and I love my followers because they get me in check. They like hold me accountable too. And they're like, you're going pretty hard with the Craig and Austin, Tommy Laren of it all. Your girl voted for Ted Cruz. And I'm like, okay. When she goes live on Instagram with Ted Cruz, that's when I'm going to have to like cut ties. But I acknowledge that she's probably a garbage goblin, but I love the woman. Do you think that she knew that she was voting for Ted Cruz? Yes. I think she's smarter than we realize. I feel like she knows what she's doing. Interesting. I feel, you know, I feel like that's, I just, I was going to say, I don't think that's true, but then I suddenly, I'm very easily convinced. <laughs> I have no leg to stand on. If you come here and tell me to believe something, I'm like, yeah, you're probably right. Um, you know, the thing with Lisa Barlow was that John Barlow catfished me. <laughs> not catfished, guys. Not catfished. Catfished. <laughs> which is where, <laughs> when a man wears a backwards, like, baseball cap, you're like, yes. oh my God, are you hot? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I wish that he would surrender to the baldness. You know that I love a bald man, and I feel like he could pull off the shaved head. Like, I feel like it's time to just let go. Like, there's nothing worse than when it's, like, that seventh grade little, like, spiky hair because they don't have that much. So they try to, like, establish volume by just, like, doing the seventh grade scoop, you know? And it's like, yeah, the Carson Daly. not fooling us. Yes, yes, the Carson Daly. (laughs) I do have to say, though, I do think that there is a new problematic fave on my horizon Ooh. and that is one kathy hilton oh my god <laughs> Okay. People have talked about like the Paris Hilton documentary. I've never watched it. Mm -hmm. Apparently people in Clubhouse were like, she's a fucking monster. Like, don't be excited about Kathy Hilton. But just like on the first episode, they're talking about how she just used to like wrangle up kids in the neighborhood and perform dental work on them. What did she do to her kids? She used her first confessional, her very first (laughs) confessional on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. She used that as an opportunity to tell an unsolicited story of performing (laughs) dental work. Like nobody asked for that story. And she's like, I know, I know what story I'm going to tell. She's like, oh my. And then 
this week we get the doogie of it all. Like I just find her <laughs> like I'm laughing out loud and I I acknowledge. So I haven't watched the Paris Hilton documentary either. Mm-hmm. So I know that we're definitely like missing a giant chunk of this woman's life, but I think that she went on this franchise to like rehab her image. Oh. And I do think yes, we're all laughing with her slash at her right now, but I don't think she's going to end up on top. Like I think no. her monsterness is going to show through. I think she could rise to like a true Disney villain status, but boy, am I chuckling along the way. It, like when I, when we met her last week, I was like, oh, okay, so Kim makes sense. Like yes. Kim, this adds up. Like I get it. Because Kyle and Kim didn't make sense, but I was like, oh, it turns out like Kyle really might be like the most normal one of her sisters, mm-hmm. but I, I'm with you in that I can already sense the heat. I can sense the back of your neck getting hot. I know you hate Kyle Richards, and I'm here to tell you that I do too. So oh, this isn't a place where we're going to be talking about how great Kyle is. There's going to be a lot of stuff I'm annoyed with her this episode. But it made sense suddenly that like like she's as kooky as Kim. Yes. But Kim was often extra kooky because she was under, under the, influence the influence of things. Mm-hmm. I think Kathy is kooky, but I think you might be right where she's like masking some like actual like insidious sort of yeah like she where is the teeth collection like where where, is the teeth where has she hidden those teeth I think she made her veneers out of them because those are really (laughs) bad teeth and you can tell like Kathy I don't know if it's it's also Kyle Kyle's doing like like a Kathy voice this season I don't know if you noticed that yes she sounds like okay sometimes she sounds like and I can't my brain hasn't been working but there's like what in like Madagascar you know the characters from yeah you know Madagascar the like little like what is it like the meerkat looking fuckers like the little guys yeah the ones that are like on the island doing all the things yeah the dancers Mm -hmm. julian i think one of them (laughs) seems is she keeps doing julian voice from madagascar (laughs) and i don't get it and it almost i'm like i can't tell if you're doing julian or if you're doing kathy or if kathy is doing julian (laughs) and you're doing kathy doing julian (laughs) And it's all also because of the teeth. The teeth are crazy. I'm going to need people to stop stop getting veneers. Like I, so that's bad. where it, it's my line in the sand. I, I forget who said it. It may have been you. It's probably you because anytime you post something, I'm like, yes. Like I'm just like <laughs> shaking my head like, yes, yes. But like I can get through the stages of the new faces and the new yes. noses and the Botox. But the moment that these women get new teeth, like that's my line in the sand. I cannot recover. And I do think that that's what Dorit has done this season yes. like Dorit looks she looks amazing but amazing. she looks like a face-tuned version of herself and it's really freaking my brain out <laughs> Kathy and Kyle Kyle looks great too like her nose yeah. job is amazing but yeah. there's something there with the two of them that they're like speaking in sister talk but like yeah. other people are present and it's very it's very compelling television honestly yeah. Kyle is always the most likable when she has a sister present because yes. it's like okay this all makes a lot lot more sense yes I agree also in students they get the veneers they look like the dentist dick commercial dog <laughs> like immediately it's all I see oh, like they there was a com- like somebody I think Tom posted I'm sure it's all over the internet the Vanderpump dog series that released on Peacock exclusively and there's like a picture of like Lisa Vanderpump standing there with a bunch of dogs but all I saw were her fucking veneers like it was these chompers that they keep getting oh. you know the one person I respect with her teeth is Sonia Morgan Sonia's like Sometimes they got them, sometimes they don't. We'll sometimes figure it they out. Pop out. Sometimes you know? they pop out. Well, let's talk about Rehasas of New York first, mostly just because I that's the one I most recently watched. Oh, wait, no, before we talk about Rehasas of New York, we need to talk about news that's breaking out in New Jersey. Ooh. Okay. Very upsetting to me because I also thought I was part of Caroline Manzo's family. I. Yeah. Tell me, what was your relationship with Caroline Manzo prior to this information coming out? Loved her. I loved her. I watched the spinoff. I loved the kids. I always knew, of course, there's like a dark side to it. Like you could tell, yeah. but it was one of those things I was willing to put my like blinders on and was like, just like really, like I, I felt like I loved her family. I yeah. loved the like chaos of it. I loved, I felt like they were very family oriented. Of course, like I think it was sometime last year that all the like alleged mob connections stuff came out and that made me go like "Uh (laughs) uh-oh oopsies Uh (laughs) uh-oh but then hearing this and hearing what she did I'm like no like how dare you so I I will be honest like I have a very tertiary understanding of what happened 
so essentially Dana Manzo, she and her boyfriend were bu- brutally attacked by somebody in their California house, right? They had like a break in and they were really beat up and it was really tragic. And it turns out that the person who sent these people to beat them up was Albert Manzo's brother who used to be married to Dina. It was his name, Tommy? Tommy, yeah. Tommy Manzo. And so that I knew. So what I understand now is that Caroline is defending him. So she wrote a character witness or letter to defend him in court. Mm, 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 mm. So not only is it going against your sister, but it's also in defense of the person who allegedly hired a hit. I mean, I don't know. I'm not involved in the mob, so <laughs> hired a something. You're not. Hired a beat down. Um, I don't know. Ten years from now, things might come out. Um, no, but so, but then she's essentially choosing the Manzos, Jeez. which then ties into the alleged mob connections of like, is she somehow involved? Is she protecting things? Like, it gets very. And I'm the same as you. I'm very like surface level because I also know myself, and if I were to go down that rabbit hole, like. I would not emerge until yeah, I can't July. Like, I just can't. <laughs> exactly same. So, and also, you know, I'll be honest with you. It's too sad for me. It's dark and like not in a fun way. It's just no. like, it makes no. you feel icky. But I did also hear that I think it was Chris was supposed to have a spinoff, probably on Peacock, if we're being honest. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but and no shade to Peacock. There are going to be some good things there. I certainly will sign up or, you know, steal my sister-in-law's subscription, whichever comes first. <laughs> Allegedly, yeah. Um, yeah. I heard that he was slated to have his own spinoff, like a Vanderpump Rules style, like kitchen chef show or something. Oh, which I'm like, how does that work? But I'm wondering if the plug will be pulled there, or if they're just going to let it go. I don't know. Bravo, I just can never get a read on like where their line in the sand is for anything. You know? No, I don't think Bravo really even has like. I don't know about Bravo's moral compass or if it really even exists anymore. I'm really not Do you sure feel about like it. We're just like these people like shouting into the void on the internet with like our petitions and our like <laughs> and our Instagram stories and like tagging them and like. Every once in a while, they'll like reshare something and we're all like congratulating each other and like, throwing a party and they're just like laughing in their like pool of like Scrooge McDuck money. Like <laughs> you're you're literally swimming, <laughs> swimming in their coins. Yes, I, I do often think that way. Like I started to think that maybe it's not that way, but I've been on Clubhouse recently and I was on Club Bravo a couple of times mm-hmm. and especially around the stuff with Tiffany, everything that went down. There was some guy from Bravo on Clubhouse And he said something like, you know, I know that like Court and Chart Westcott are saying problematic things, but have we seen like, has Cameron actually said something terrible um, that's like racist to Tiffany? And everybody in the room was like, what the fuck? Did you watch the show? Like everybody was like, they lit him up. But this is a guy that has... And I don't know who he is. I don't know what his name is. I just know that he works in Bravo somewhere. And he was asking these questions. And I was like, you know, it very much feels like the way Leo is just sort of like reading an article about Heather's podcast, but not actually listening to her podcast. Mm-hmm. It feels a lot like that. Yeah, where it's like very surface level and they're kind of like taking the Cliff Notes version to like be able to talk on it. And it's like, oh, you don't actually know anything. As I think they mostly just want the bottom line. Like that's really all they care about. The And the evidence to that exhibit A is Kelly Dodd. Like Kelly Dodd is a perfect example that Bravo is going to protect their pocket before anything having to do with a moral compass because Kelly Dodd represents Orange County. Like her beliefs and the what she's saying on social media, while problematic and unsafe and awful, it's the people that are tuning into Orange County or that see themselves in Orange County are agreeing with her. And there are people saying like, I only watch Orange County because of Kelly Dodd. And so Bravo does this thing where it like it rides the line of like how far can we push it of being in the center where we're appeasing people by like reposting a petition but Mm -hmm. also not firing Kelly Dodd so that this group of people feels like they're being heard as well yeah I also think that Bravo is still under this like delusion that the people that they were trying to tell us that we should aspire to be like when Housewives started are still the same like that like those people watched OC were like oh yeah this is so aspirational a bunch of people thought that maybe I'm sure they did and those are still their viewers like I think that they still think that that is what they are selling and I'm like no we've moved on from that first of all I don't even think that OC ladies are like that rich like (laughs) 
They're actually not. You know, they're wealthy and successful in whatever way. But like, if you think about now all of the franchises that we've had, OC is like very slim picks. Yeah, no, definitely. I didn't watch OC last last year, or maybe even the year before. But I do remember that Kelly, at some point after her divorce, had moved into this like really weird looking apartment. The upper floor. The upper floor. And they had stairs on which that she the, allegedly had pushed her mother down. So anyway, I can't believe I'm, I'm spending too much time talking about OC, a show I don't I'm sorry. I about, brought us here, so yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I take accountability for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please do. Okay. So let's talk about Real Housewives of New York. We start the episode with Sonia's breakdown, which is fueled by her fear that her daughter, who is a great, great granddaughter of one of the oldest and wealthiest American families, won't be able to pay her bills because Ramona likes Wells Fargo. The ladies shuck oysters. We meet Garth. Leah takes a dumb vow of silence, and then she picks a dumb fight with Holla Heather Thompson. What are we going to do with Sonia, Chelsea? I don't know, because it's at this point, like, it's getting sad and dark, and it's been sad and dark, and I just feel like, at what point are we witnessing something that is, like, maybe shouldn't be on television because I really do feel for her and there's like real pain happening. And I do acknowledge, I think that Sonia is much smarter than any of us give her credit for. I think she knows what she's doing to some extent. I think that she's like very crafty in the persona that she portrays on the show, but it's, it, it's twofold. It's one is I really hope that she's not just seeing this healer and that she's like seeing a therapist because this is now like 10 years of the same thing we're hearing. But then selfishly also as a viewer, I'm like, okay, and this is 10 years of the same thing we're hearing and experiencing. And I do like, I've, I've called, I've like, I've wanted this for, I've said it a thousand times, but like, I want there to be a point where OGs become a friend of, and a friend of in the capacity of like the days of, your where like they're still very much a part of everything but we don't have to have those at home scenes like they're still on all the cast trips they're at all the dinners yeah they're there to make us laugh and they're there to start drama but like her story at this point unfortunately has been told because there's no resolution in sight and it's like how much longer can we hear about this life that you don't have anymore and it's like i understand that you're grieving the loss of this life you thought you had but like it's gone it's extremely sad and you know what what's interesting interesting is like later on we first see this fight with Sonia and Ramona and Ramona initially is obviously she's being very aggressive with what she's saying to her mm-hmm. and Ramona says I don't know what she said but she really comes at Sonia Sonia gets upset because Ramona's not saying anything that's not true mm-hmm. but she eventually knows Ramona knows to de-escalate she's like okay this is getting crazy which Ramona's a lot of really monstrous things but she grew up with like an, an abusive yeah. aggressive like alcoholic father and I think that as a result she's really really aware of how to like de-escalate from Sonia. So she de-escalates, she walks away. Later on, Sonia gets into that like completely everyone is sober fight with Luann. And Luann in that moment takes like all episode really, takes every opportunity she can to like trash Sonia. And so you have this interesting dynamic where these are supposedly two of Sonia's best friends in the show at her job. Mm -hmm. And so you have Ramona who the next morning is actually lovely to her. Like I want to ask you... As a mental health professional, what do you think about Ramona as a therapist to Sonia? I was horrified at how good she was. Like, <laughs> right? I mean, like, I truly, the last couple of seasons, I've been like, I think Ramona is truly in therapy because we, like, hear her yes. using these, like, buzzwords. Yes. But, like, I believe that, like, some of it is soaking in. Like, I, I hate to be the one that's like, I think Ramona Singer might be changing. But like the things that she was saying was spot on. And it was almost like she was like this little kid, like playing the part, like, okay, we're going to play therapy and I'm going to be the teacher. (laughs) Because at one point she like leans forward and she goes, aha, I think we're onto something. And I was like, what is like, I have expected her to be like, I think we've covered a lot of ground, you know, take a deep breath and I'll see you next Tuesday. Like, thank you. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was like very pleasantly surprised. And Sonia is really receptive to Ramona when she's doing that. But so she's got this dynamic where Ramona, yes, she can get very aggressive with her as well. And she can be a little mean to her. But when she mm-hmm. catch, when she has 
both the time to and the clarity to, Ramona is actually quite sweet to Sonia. Yeah. Luann, on the other hand, is really quite the monster. Like, I, <laughs> she's so crazy. It's hard for me because I go back and forth. Like, whenever, especially whenever Luann and Sonia are, like, going at each other, I, like, find myself understanding both sides of it. Mm-hmm. And I keep going back and forth because typically the way that Luann approaches it is always dead wrong because <laughs> Luann is a narcissist. Like, yes. and that's not a mental health diagnosis. That is just me as a viewer saying, <laughs> this bitch be loving herself. Yeah. And I like, so she sometimes gets caught in her feelings and her perceptions of things, but also like, Sonia cannot continue to be saying like that Luann's ex-husband was hers first. Like that's (laughs) the thing is like, I imagine myself, if I were friends with Sonia, like how exhausting that must be (laughs) to be like having to constantly coddle her and validate her and make her feel good. And then also be like having her get drunk and being like, by the way, I banged your ex-husband first. It's like, at what point are we letting things go? You're right. I had, I skipped that from my memory only because I think I was already so annoyed with Luann because in like a confessional scene, she was like, you know, I've got this nice boyfriend, the cabaret (laughs) career. Like, of course she's going to be jealous. I'm like, shut the fuck up, Luann. Shut up. God. And so after that, anything Lou did, I was like, shut up. And then she has the boyfriend. The boyfriend showed up. What did you think about Garth? I felt like they were, I know that like we use the term gaslighting too frequently on Bravo. Mm -hmm. They gaslighted us. I don't care. Like I was gaslit. Garth is not hot. Like Garth is not hot. The man looks like he was one puka shell necklace away from having my brother's seventh grade aesthetic. Like he (laughs) had the full bowl cut, the bleached hair. Like he just needed a Hawaiian shirt and some slides and he was like ready for the sock hop, you know? Yes. Yeah, he definitely was. And then later on they're talking and as a South Asian, I have to point this out, she keeps talking about how Garth makes the best lamb curry. And I was like, I don't trust the Slavic man's curry. Okay. Like don't (laughs) tell me that his curry is so good like I was so offended by that I was like there are no brown people in your life like why are you doing this to me and yes I agree I was gaslit but at the same time Chelsea you have to remember these are women who have fought over Harry Dubin (laughs) yeah Wow. That really does put in perspective. I just literally, I know this is an auditory experience, but I did a literal spit take at that. Because, yeah, that, that really, that really sends the message home. Yeah. Garth really is like the best thing that these women have seen in God knows how long. Yeah. Did you feel like they were using curry as like a double entendre? I did not want to be a part of this narrative. Wait. At one point, Luann's like, the girls love looking at Garth. And wait until they taste his curry. Oh, no. And I was just like, I, I love some curry. No, I love some I lamb curry. I do not. I do not need the image of the women tasting Garth's oh, no. curry. Oh, no. Well, <laughs> well, now that's that is what I think. Now that's what I think. All right. So Leah was having her moments this episode. She's really on one. She's obviously going through a lot. Now, what did you think about Leah's vow of silence? Why? (laughs) Why? I, this is my problem with Leah. And actually, I can't take credit for this because I was just on Clubhouse with Kendrick from Mm -hmm. the Housewives of Marvel 2 podcast. And he said this. She was having her Drew Sidora moment where she really Mm. thought she was doing something. Like she had this idea and she thought it was going to be something. And the audience was just like, why? Why? No, no. Boo. Like it just didn't make sense. And then she quit it. It wasn't even like she made it till six. Then all of a sudden she's like, oh, this isn't working because now actually I'm just going to be cut out of all of these scenes. I better start talking. Yes. Yes. That's basically what happened. And I agree. It was her. She was, She really thought she was doing something. She also thought she was really doing something last episode when she was trying to call Ramona out about the plasma. Like, yeah, nobody thinks that Ramona actually donated anything because I don't think that Ramona knows what plasma is. So <laughs> you're also trying to convince us to what? Like take out her pitchforks and go after Ramona Singer it's not gonna happen like like it or not Leah you are on Ramona's show I feel like she gave up that vow of silence real quick 
when she saw Ebony flawlessly and seamlessly filling that voice of reason role on the limo when yes. Sonia and Luann were going back and forth. Ebony like stepped up to the plate and filled that role that usually Leah does of the moderator and the voice of reason with like a hint of like snark and shade. And yes. I think Leah was like, oh shit, I better start yeah. talking because that's usually me. Yeah, exactly. She's like, I just lost my job. Um, so Leah, first she's just like belligerent and just yelling at everyone. She takes this vow of silence and then her big raging thing that she's been taking every moment she can to talk about is she's really mad at Heather Thompson. So Chelsea, I have to ask, do you like Heather Thompson? Hello. <laughs> I'm a I big, have, I, I'm a big fan. Okay, good. So I should have actually made her probably my problematic babe. I, I did not realize, and this is like what a narcissist I am, that I just assume like... <laughs> I just assume like whoever I love, everybody loves. And so it was a couple of months ago when we saw like that when every when it leaked that Heather was filming, I like posted yeah. on my stories like, yes, guys, like we did it, Joe. Like we're doing it. Like yeah. Heather's here. And then my DMs were just of people being like, are you effing kidding me? Like I hate Heather. Like how dare you? How could you do this to me? Question mark. And I was like, oh cool 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 she's low-key the most polarizing person in bravo history got it who would have thought it's insane to me that she is because like i actually will say the season when heather came on and i remember seeing holla in the tagline that is the one season where i was like oh the show has like it's over it's done like bethany left the ladies were fighting too much they try to get this lady on and she's saying holla and she's so annoying like i'm not watching the show and so i really didn't give the, that season a ton of attention i think that was actually the season with the pirate mm -hmm. so eventually i did i was like okay i need to watch this again but even you know her being able to take on aviva drescher is one of my favorite things of all time like yeah how can you not like heather but but at the same time, now I've heard from people now, you know, yes, 10 years ago, perhaps I wasn't as aware of the way that these things come off. But yeah, she was kind of still talking about she talked about her relationship with black people, kind of like the way that Leah talks about streetwear. A hundred, And that's the funny thing is that they are two sides of the same coin. Like yeah. they are just they are Wendy Williams hugging her wax. Yeah. Like they are the same. And that I think is why they rub each other the wrong way is because they're the same. It's e it's much easier to point out things in other people that instead of pointing out things in yourself that might be problematic. I will say the thing about Heather, and I'm not one to stan anybody. I think everybody has their faults. Everybody has their good qualities. I felt like she brought a level of roundedness to the show. And I felt like she brought a level of the voice of reason. She was a straight shooter. When there's so much chaos, she was kind of like our anchor of like, okay. And a lot of times the Greek chorus too, of like mirroring or echoing what we're thinking as the viewer. And I think that that's a really hard role on New York to fill because sometimes it was Bethany, but Bethany was also a cuckoo bird. Like mm -hmm. she, I just feel like she played a very important role and one that we haven't really gotten back yet since she left. So I was really excited to see her. And it was interesting that like, it was almost like Leah made it her mission to make it so that she wouldn't come back because I think yes. the initial plan we've seen in COVID that they've gone back to this having the friends of more involved and really like a part of the cast the way that they used to so I think the initial plan was for her to be like around a lot yeah. mm -hmm. and it seems like Leah made it her mission to like make that not a thing also I don't believe this narrative that like Luann didn't know that Heather said something on the podcast like you're right. telling me that there was this like salacious headline and Luann Luann never read it. You're telling me Luann de Lesseps doesn't have a Google alert on herself? Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't believe that. And even the way that, like, Luann was, like, pretending to be so upset at the dinner, I don't think that she really was. Like, I think they were almost like, okay, she's like, like, the little kid wants us to play with her, so we're just gonna go along with it for a little bit, and then we actually don't give a shit. And yeah, she made an accusation that Luann does hard drugs. Yeah, and Joe Gorga doesn't pay his bills. Like, we're not... <laughs> This isn't news. It's just like, it's so annoying. What was it the thing that just came out recently that was like 
so oh yes so you watch Shadows of Sunset yes yeah it, the big breaking news was that Mike Shuad finally admitted that those text messages that he sent to that girl were actually him it was like yeah no. well, this is not news his iCloud wasn't hacked and <laughs> there was one single conversation that took place I just like love the idea that there's like a hacker out there that is so specific that they're gonna like hack your iCloud just to like ruin your relationship with one single message you know like that is actually diabolical <laughs> yeah yeah it's like the same thing it's like i nobody's shocked like nobody's like oh my god gasp not the countess doing our drugs <laughs> like we all watch that season <laughs> I just feel like this is my issue with Leah is I, I called it that she was going to have the second season housewives curse where she's yeah. been pumped up the first season. Everybody loved her. She had like an unprecedented great edit. I think that they were almost doing like damage control because we, they knew that we as the audience were going to be Googling her and they almost had to like course yeah. correct for some of the things we would find. Like she had an amazing first season. Like I can't think of really anybody that had a better first season out of the jump than Leah McSweeney. Yeah. And so I knew that like, you can't keep that pace up. She was due for like, at least a little dip. I think the issue now too with her is that she thinks she knows how to play the game. Like she's like, I have one season under my belt. I know what I'm doing now. But the best housewives are the ones who are messy and keep their hands clean. Like it almost yes. would have been worth it had she slowly brought up, like I'm imagining how somebody like an experienced veteran, I'm trying to think like a like Karen a, Huger. Yes. Or, or like the way LVP used to do it. it back in the day. Day, LVP perfect example like season one or two LVP of like bringing up like oh darling Heather Holland Thompson's coming oh have you heard her podcast she just launched this podcast so weird I saw this headline and then yeah. like sending the headline to the group and just being like oh I hope this doesn't come out that would be terrible and <laughs> yeah. then like leaving it there because like the women also know what they're doing like all she had to do was set it up like t yeah. put the ball on the t and let it happen yes. but instead it's like she tries to orchestrate it in this way yep. that it becomes like this production rather than just saying like oh Heather's coming she was talking mad shit about you on her podcast like she was saying you did hard drugs and leaving it there Luann is going to take the swing like you don't have yes. to like do it for her you don't have to take the bat and swing it for her and I think that's where she loses it it's like it becomes less fun to watch as a viewer when you're watching her like spell it out for us yep exactly and for those reasons Leah McSweeney you're chopped <laughs> <laughs> do you have any other thoughts about new york no i'm enjoying it i'm loving ebony i'm yeah. feeling like they're picking up steam i'm really like for only having five housewives i feel like they're doing a really good job yeah it's very content rich like i never get bored i never like have to open up my phone and start playing a game like mm -hmm. you know that often happens with beverly hills which we're going to talk about now. <laughs> so on this episode of Beverly Hills, we got to know Crystal more. Garcelle and Kyle have a lunch and Garcelle like very politely and beautifully slays Kyle Richard. Just rounds of applause for that. Mm -hmm. The ladies go to Lake Tahoe where they cook and play games. And as usual, everybody except for the women of color are extremely fake to each other. And Sutton might be maybe like a little bit racist. No. <laughs> Sutton. <laughs> yeah. So Crystal, I really love this intro to her. I love that we got to know more about her than we'd like mm -hmm. ever known about Erica. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So Crystal for me had a tough first episode because she was kind of an asshole. <laughs> but as we learned more about her this episode, I'm like, oh, you're an asshole, but you're also low key a great housewife. Like I'm so excited yes. to learn her story, to learn more about her. We met Lucy, who I need just a full spin off of. I love yes. that Lucy, her, I don't even know her title, nanny housekeeper, queen of the house, Loki boss. boss. Like yeah. is, I love that she's just bossing Crystal around of like, are you taking notes? Like this is the grocery <laughs> list now. Like I love her. I love that her brother is a pop star, but she's made her, she's made him her manny. Like there's just so <laughs> many layers to her. And I feel like she has like big dick energy and I'm here yes. for it. She's not about to hide it like I you know I watched it and I was so happy for her and it kind of crushed me at the same time because it did pull me back to like thinking about Tiffany and how Tiffany also had the potential of having big dick energy but she 
was just with the wrong people who are like not there to celebrate her. And I think in this situation, Crystal knows her. She knows her standing with these women. Like essentially her husband is the most wealthy out of all of them, I'm pretty sure. So that kind of also helps. Did you know though, this is like, I just found this out though. Her husband directed The Lion King. Oh my God, I didn't know. (laughs) I didn't know that. I didn't know. Yeah, just like no. she's so low key about it. She's so low key. She never ever talks about. It. Nobody <laughs> ever mentions it. It's like I do have constant. to say, it was like very endearing when she's like, "I don't really brag about myself, but I will brag about my husband." I'm like, "That's actually lovely." Yeah, and you know what? She should. It's it's great. Like, and I think I like the fact that she doesn't hide it. She's really honest about it. Like, yeah, I'm famous because my husband made The Lion King, and that that is what it is. I love that. Mm-hmm. So Garcelle and Kyle have this lunch and Garcelle basically explains to Kyle that she's a dick and I really appreciated it. I loved this conversation. It was perfect because Kyle definitely was caught off guard. My favorite thing about Garcelle is the Beverly Hills women are constantly fake smiling at each other and Garcelle is not here for it. She's she does not give a shit. She has the biggest dick energy in the room. Yeah. She truly like, and I mean, like, I don't want to use that term loosely. I know I've been throwing it around, but truly, if I had to pick one person, yeah. Kathy Hilton, but also Garcelle, like, because she <laughs> truly like Garcelle sits there and she looks at you with those eyes that are like, are you really, you're going to, no, you're not going to yeah. do that. Because Kyle was like, it was classic Kyle to be like, I did this terrible thing, but I just want to move forward. I just want to give you a hug. I've been yeah. tested. Let's oh. hug. And Garcelle's Ugh. like. We can hug, but let's circle back to you saying I didn't pay my fucking bill. She's like, can we circle back (laughs) to that allegation you made about me on national television? And Kyle was like, I think even then caught off guard. Like, I think Kyle is so, and same with Brenna last week. Like, I think they're so used to this, like, formula that takes place on Beverly Hills of, like, we do nasty things to each other. Then we have this fake conversation. We say we're going to move on. And then we continue talking shit. And Garcelle's like, no, actually, like, we're going to talk about it. It was perfect. And, you know, because... Because of the fact that Bravo has ha- has done quite a terrible job about talking about things that affect people of color, I do think that right now, so far, Beverly Hills is doing pretty well. Like, And it all comes down to the people that they're actually casting, right? Garcelle has the capacity of speaking of these things. Ebony has the capacity of speaking of these things. They're intellectuals. They understand how they're able to. And they a- actually also give them the space where even though Kyle is, we know, a selfish monster, she's still smart enough to take a pause and say I didn't know that and you know this is just something that I, I'm getting to know now like she wasn't she didn't try to double down on it whatever I do just because I hate Kyle she was like I didn't know this about Garcelle but now it's good I'm gonna get to know her better I'm like okay but why does she bother me so much <laughs> she bothers me a lot and I don't know what's happening the last two episodes I've been like oh Okay. All right, no. Kyle. And I'm like, no, 2020, what, 2021, what's happening? Like, no. But I will say, like, the way she handled this initially when she was like, ah, 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 like yeah, ah, of yeah. course I wouldn't do ah, ah, ah. Like, yeah. she was, like, very caught off guard. But I do have to give her a sliver of credit that she did sit with the information. And it was basically the intent versus impact conversation of, like, yes. of course, that was not the reason I went after you. That was not my intention. But, like, I understand a little bit more of where you're coming from and why that was so difficult for you. And jumping ahead just till the end of the episode, I yeah. actually felt like when she was having that conversation with Sutton and Crystal, she wasn't coming from it from a place of, like, a victim of, like, I can't yes. believe – she actually was coming from it of like, I feel like I understand Garcelle more now and yep. I'm going to do better to be aware of that. Like I felt like she had was coming from a place of like more understanding and it was yes. Sutton that was like, no, I'm actually going to be the worst now, you know? Yeah, they were – first of all, Sutton was – a little lit, I think. Mm -hmm. She was kind of obviously in her feelings about this whole conversation. But one thing that I did think that was really interesting is that when Crystal and Sutton are having this conversation and Sutton is saying that she doesn't want to talk about stereotypes and race and is complaining about being white and there being a bunch of rednecks that represent her, because that's really hard for her, you guys. (laughs) And they're having this discussion and Crystal like really lays it into her because it's insane that you wouldn't want to talk about this. Kyle Richards is just sitting on the counter and she's just smirking and watching. I was like, that's you. That's who you are. 
that's who you are, Kyle. I took note of that too because, and I wrote in my notes because I'm going to cover it on my Patreon this week, but like when she made that little face, I was like, and right now Kyle is sighing the biggest sigh of relief that she's like, oh, I'm not going to be the racist this year. <laughs> She's like, yes. it's not going to be me. Yes. Oh, my God. That's what it was, really. You know, I know Sutton released some sort of statement saying that she didn't mean it that way or that it was inappropriate and she's sorry and everything. And I'm always here to say that there's growth available for everyone. We can all grow. But it was uh, it was rough. I would, and I was just like, I'm really glad that Crystal is there. Because if she wasn't there and Kyle was having that conversation would say Dorit... I don't know how that would go. If she had a conversation with like Rinna and she was like, oh yeah, I had this conversation with Garcelle, Rinna would just like shake her head violently the way she does. Mm -hmm. And she'd be like, yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, oh, and like, that's it. That's, there would be no substance there. And if Sutton like interjected, they would just kind of stare at her because that's what they do at Beverly Hills when there's conflict. The whole thing was so interesting because Sutton didn't need to even open her mouth. Like, yes, yeah. she was drunk and it was clear that they all had been drinking and partying and like sometimes you just say things that maybe you wouldn't say if you weren't drunk but like this wasn't even about her and she interjected and it was just like the perfect example of white fragility of the mere idea that something another white person did could have triggered a person in a way that they weren't intending to was like too much for her and she's yeah. even like I'm not gonna do this I'm not gonna do this <laughs> and it's like what are you even doing but I think it speaks to also the importance of representation and like we're seeing a cast one of the first times where there's two women of color and there's not just one token woman yes. of color and I loved yes. how Crystal started that by saying like as somebody who's not white I can't speak to her experience but let me tell you about mine and it was yes. like the perfect example of like solidarity while acknowledging that there's differences between Garcelle and herself and their lived experience and it's yes. like I'm almost pissed at Sutton for many reasons but also because like I wanted to hear more about Crystal yes. and her experiences Absolutely. and learn more about her like I want to hear that and instead Sutton's like cutting in to then just be a dick yeah, for no good reason. Just no. no good reason. Now they play this game, the dumb two truths and a lie that we got a preview for in the, the trailer of this goddamn season. <laughs> and I was like, of course nothing happened. Of course we didn't find out anything, but we did find out that Erica apparently was what, wearing a wire for some investigation. Now do you think that it was for her own husband? I mean, it's either that or she's admitting she worked for the mafia. So like, yeah. which is which is better? Like, I just, I'm so confused by this timeline. I know that that one tweet was going around that this took place yeah. like October 28th. She filed for divorce November 3rd. So like we're approaching the divorce timeline. And while she's alluded to the fact that her quarantine was hard, she's talking about like me and Tom have never been closer. We've been talking. Like, yeah. I'm just so confused. Like, I guess the big question is like, what does she know and what is she involved in? And maybe the big twist is that she has been so quiet about it because she was involved and like taking him down which would be like I mean honestly M. Night Shyamalan who if that if yeah. that happens <laughs> seriously but I just like I know she usually never talks about herself or her emotions or like what's actually going on in her life but like how are you even in like the realm of a quote unquote normal divorce like how are you going from like me and Tom sat around the kitchen table every <laughs> night and we uh, we've never been closer to being like oh by the way we're getting divorced like how yeah. does it go from that yeah. you know yeah and it's weird that she she it's one thing to like I'm not sure what game she's playing right are you playing the game where you're saying like I had no idea and we were so close and then I suddenly found out all this stuff about him and then I had to divorce him is that the game that you're playing or are you playing the other game which is that you are part of the investigation that's going to take him down because she, there's just there's a lot of weird shit that Erica is doing and I can't quite put my finger on the arc that she's trying to show on the show like I don't think right. that even and she knows what her storyline is this season or how she's going to manage it. Right. The editors are really not holding back with her, which is good. I mean, they played expensive to be me as that transition. Like, good heavens. Good heavens. My God. Also, when they go to Lake Tahoe, I have to point this out because it's like another Kyle thing that really drove me crazy. <laughs> Garcelle tells the ladies that she's afraid of flying. Now, Kyle, what happened, honey? What happened? I thought you were so afraid of flying. Nor we are synced at the brain because <laughs> my, 
<laughs> my comment on this. And again, if you guys want to hear all my thoughts, support me on Patreon. I'm exclusively yes, yes, covering yes. it over there. <laughs> but my comment was that you know that Kyle Richards was seething, but she's like, this bitch just low key accused me of doing something problematic, and now <laughs> she's stealing my phobia, and I can't say a damn thing. <laughs> Especially because, like, Kyle's phobia... Look, I'm not here to tell somebody that their experience is not real. But, like, the sudden shift from, like, I'm so afraid of flying that I need to hold on to LVP and do splits and put my foot on the top of... In the the first season, she brought, like, the Jewish Bible with her on the flight. (laughs) Like, I just did a rewatch for Monty's Monty's Patreon. Like, the very first episode, she literally brings the Jewish Bible and is like, I'm and praying over it because she was so frightened. I don't believe any of that. I think that she's just so phony. There's nothing about Kyle that's authentic, but I will say that her face work is phenomenal because I think she's going to Dorit's doctor. Yeah, she went from prop work in season one to now she's having to switch lanes a little bit. Now she's just concerned that her nose is ballooning in air. And again, (laughs) freaking Kathy Hilton being like, well, it did get a little bit swollen (laughs) like that like harsh harsh truth that only a sister can give you of like yeah I was looking a little swollen (laughs) yeah hey we were talking I think you and I when initially it was revealed that Kathy would be on this season you and I were talking about the Barbie skipper energy that we might get like I'm not sure if we're there yet it's not Barbie skipper because I think it's too dark (laughs) I mean it's Barbie doogie yeah (laughs) <laughs> exactly watching right. kyle die a thousand deaths when <laughs> kathy was repeatedly calling her doogie at the dinner table like i just kathy hilton when she, when they're like what is a doogie and she's like you know a doogie like a little doogie <laughs> she no that did not explain that whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> she's just like it's her pet name it's her like baby love name and I was like you're just saying words they don't mean anything <laughs> um, would you eat a meal that Kyle prepared or that meal I mean that meal I know not yeah. well yeah, I don't know I like to eat I'd probably scrape <laughs> off the top I did I was so impressed I was like again gonna give her some kadoos and then I saw it catch on fire and I was like ah there it is but I do <laughs> believe like because Kyle there's always gonna be a scene of her cooking at the kitchen island being a good mom like I do yeah. believe she actually does cook so I would probably take her over like anybody else on the cast for sure she cooks but that night I don't even know if she really even cooked because there was a chef that was doing all right. the work and th- that's what i was gonna say somebody else like popped in i'm like where is this fellow like <laughs> yeah. okay who are you i also want to point out because there was not a lot of dorit content this episode and i i love dorit mm-hmm. dorit is okay i'm gonna say a statement and i don't know if it's a crazy statement to make i think dorit might be the original lisa barlow mm. their is energy that is why very I love much lisa barlow because dorit is like my number one <laughs> is that have you just like solved a mystery i think you have. Chelsea, I believe in psychology, they call it a breakthrough. <laughs> Somewhere Ramona's in lingerie, like, see you next week. <laughs> That makes total sense. Dorit's worrying me because I think that she's coasting a little bit. I know we're mm. only two episodes in. I We have plenty to go. Last season, she was like the weirdly accented voice of reason, which I appreciated because yes. I was like, how did we get here? Of course, in 2020, somehow Dorit has become the voice of reason. Like every, we are living in the upside down. Yeah. But I feel like she hasn't really, she's been very much just in the background so far. And that concerns me because I'm like, okay, Dorit, like you're going to need to do something soon. I agree with that because I do love Dorit and I wonder if Dorit is also like really coasting on just how beautiful, how enchanting she is to a lot of people on the internet and just like Mm -hmm. how her Instagram, her like social media journey is great. But I thought one of the funniest things was when they cut to like a flashback of some lunch with Dorit and I was like, who is she? (laughs) Who's this old housewife? I forget her. (laughs) Yeah, it is. I mean, she shows up every season, new house, new accent, new face. Like, it's it's just a rite of passage for Beverly Hills. That's how we know the seasons are changing. And I love (laughs) that, like, Mauricio and PK are now just, like, doing their bromance thing. Like, your friend, your close friend. My close personal friend, PK. I have to be careful what I say. 
PK, don't fo- unfollow me, please. Um, <laughs> and I have to say, little Jaggy holding okay, the blackmail. Well, I guess you're not going to get hugs and kisses anymore. I'm like, <laughs> damn, this kid knows what he's doing. I love him. I just love that he was like straight up went up to his mind. He was like, you don't look good. You look like you're wearing a robe. Like he went from not saying any words to like completely trashing his mother. And I was like, I kind of love this journey, Jaggy. <laughs> I love also it. love Phoenix. Love She's Phoenix. finally getting her attention because we didn't see her for a couple of years. Was she the one that dropped – or was it Jaggy who dropped the like 3D claymation characters? Oh, it was Jaggy. Oh, I was going to say if that was Phoenix that like she was like banished and she like is yeah. finally coming back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, do you even think it's worth to talk about this conversation with Lisa Rinna and Garcelle? Because Garcelle just like does not care. Well, I don't know what- everyone is looking for the only thing that's in my opinion worth talking about is the fact that like they're not speaking the same language they are not on the mm-hmm. same show they are not on the same planet like garcelle i feel like is trying to have a conversation with lisa rinna her friend of 20 plus years and lisa rinna the tv villain character caricature is having a conversation <laughs> back with garcelle like garcelle is like trying to like sit down a child and being like this is why we I don't know I'm like using the example from my real life what did I say a thousand times today hands are not for hitting hands are not for hitting (laughs) and Rena's like and here's a baseball bat because I'm on reality tv (laughs) (laughs) you know like yeah she's like that's showbiz baby like (laughs) hey see because <laughs> like Garcelle gives this like very like heartfelt thing of like you know trust is so important how can I trust you all this thing and then when Lisa Rinna's like yay oh yay you shared that with me I'm like this is not an appropriate reaction to what she just said <laughs> you know what's happening it was so weird it almost sometimes feels like when Garcelle is sitting with Lisa Rinna and having a conversation like Garcelle is looking at Lisa Rinna's face but I imagine that Lisa Rinna's vision is like Garcelle Garcelle is there and Garcelle is blurry. But really what Gar- <laughs> Lisa Rinna sees is like the room behind her and like the cameras, you know, like, like yeah. Lisa is not thinking about the person who is sitting in front of her and, and she just that's why she just ch- just nods. She just does her like aggressive nods, mm-hmm. you know. She's like the five things that she says. And let me tell you something, Chelsea. Lisa Rinna is my problematic favorite. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Well, it's- this has been fun. Bye. Follow me at Ono oh Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> not last season last season i think she did too much i feel like okay this is the thing about lisa Rinna. when she's good she's so good like when she's playing that role and it's hitting and it's like like i actually feel like she would be an amazing friend of i don't need any home scenes with harry hamlin like being forced to be there barbecuing like i don't need to see any <laughs> of that but if we were to have lisa Rinna, the friend of who shows up and is like hi hello oh hello yeah. Oh, are people doing coke in your bathroom? Like, I'd be here for it. Yeah. The issue is she loses me when she's like telling everybody else to own it, but she hasn't had a storyline in God knows ever, maybe ever, like that that doesn't revolve around a family member that's like authentically her showing herself to the camera and to us as the audience. So when she's good, she's so good. And then when it's forced, it's so forced. The way that you said like Kyle is better when she's with a sister, I think Lisa Rinna is better when she's with Eileen. Yes. I haven't loved her since Eileen left because Eileen was like her voice of reason anchor. Like they were a partnership where like Eileen wasn't necessarily very compelling television, but like as a duo of the two of them coming in, it was like magic. Yeah, exactly. Well, any other thoughts about Beverly Hills? No, I'm like cautiously optimistic. I'm really enjoying it for the first time in a while. Like I was like laughing. I was engaged. I was like here for it. And I was like, what is happening? Is this going to continue? I was also like fully watching it. I wasn't distracted at all because I was annoyed last episode. The premiere was like eight minutes of previews. Yeah. So that's never a good sign. But this was good. This was promising. Hi, everyone. So before we get into the Real Housewives of New Jersey discussion with Chelsea, I want to preface this part of the episode by saying that we did not cover the discussion around sexual harassment because we truly didn't have the emotional space to talk about it. After seeing the reactions and honestly warranted outrage on social media about how the discussion was presented, Chelsea opted out of watching the reunion because it was very triggering due to her own personal experiences. The fact that this extremely sensitive and triggering topic was presented on the show with the same humor as Teresa not knowing what an analogy is or how to say 
say the word ingredients was extremely callous and painful to watch. In an effort to be mindful of our guests and also our listeners' experiences, we will not be covering that topic this week on the podcast. We might talk about it next week. We'll figure it out. Okay, back to the show. On the Real Housewives of New Jersey, this we got the second last part of the reunion. We're finally done with the season. I actually enjoyed the season, but I think the reunions were quite lackluster. Part one was good. Part two, I was just like, why are we watching this? But majority of the reunion was spent just explaining words to Teresa, which is just exhausting and like not fun and cute anymore. Like it was fun when you couldn't say ingredients 10, 12 years ago. But like, we're done with this shtick. Now you're just dumb and it's not fun but the big fight was jennifer aiden versus marge so marge is trying to drunk shame jennifer which i like thought was not fair because i think all of us were sloppy drunk moms being stuck in a quarantine and she's got a thousand babies so a oh, hundred well i just like i just had my cousin's wedding um <laughs> this past weekend and so let me tell you <laughs> that i had my <laughs> own jennifer aiden experience <laughs> not quite to that level but like i was like freedom <laughs> like, yeah the first yeah. time we had left my kids I was like you know ready no I didn't get like carted off or throwing up on myself as I left but like I totally understand that and I think Marge sometimes toes the line of like when it comes from a place of concern mm -hmm. and like you're actually like wanting to take care of your friend and making sure they're okay like I think that's very admirable and I think all of us need that like mom friend of the group that's like okay it's probably time to drink water and you know like when that person says it to you it's coming from love but Marge like teeters sometimes for me where it's like you're actually just kind of being very judgmental and like it doesn't make anybody want to do what you want them to to do yeah I struggle with Marge because she subscribes to like Western feminism and even though I would never ever say that Jennifer Eden is like a feminist she's obviously not like she's really problematic she says really problematic slut shamey things I think sometimes the jabs that Marge throws at Jennifer are really problematic she makes a lot of comments that kind of look down on Jennifer's like culture and her family life and her whole setup I'll just never forget how much of a hard time she gave her brother for getting married to a girl from Turkey. It was just really rough. And I feel like that kind of set it off. And once that happened, it was like, why would Jennifer trust you with anything mm -hmm. or try to be your friend when you've literally trashed her culture? You know what I mean? So I yeah, struggle I with think... Marge there because I do love me Marge. I love Marge too. But I, so Quinn from Know That Podcast said it. Yeah. And like, I had been trying to figure out, I'd been like gathering my thoughts and I've been like, what is bothering me about this conversation. And first of all, I think true feminism is letting women have agency over their lives for the decisions that they want to make for their own yes. lives. So a woman who wants to stay at home or a woman that wants to go to work, like both are acceptable and should be celebrated as choices that they are making for their life. Like that is true feminism is that women get to decide yep. and it doesn't have to be you're going to work or you're staying home or maybe you're doing both. Like there is no yep right answer and that is feminism but Quinn said that Marge has like 80s feminism which is inherently white feminism yeah. of the idea that like the right thing to do is to go to work and you know have a career and do the damn thing and inherently then women who are choosing to stay at home and raise a family are not doing feminism right yes. and so then by doing that you're actually not being a feminist because you're putting down another woman for the choice that they are making and I I also think there is this element where Marge does not take into account Jennifer's culture at all, which I think is very white feminism driven yep. in terms of like, this is the way our culture sees it. This is what we think we should do as Western white women. Yep. And I just feel like, you know, there's this degree of like, they're just not connecting. And I think that they could both learn so much from each other if there was that open line of communication and that like softening of like, this is how I do it, but tell me yep. more about your your story and why you're making the choices you're making but instead they're just like there's this element I think we as women sometimes fall into this trap that like we're so worried about defending the choices that we have made that we're going to put yep. down choices that are different than ours because if we were to acknowledge that another person makes a different choice than us then yes. maybe inherently we're worried that we made the wrong one you know oh my god yes that's exactly it <laughs> yeah I just like feel like I blacked out I hope I made sense but <laughs> I was I'm like, came to, to call Bill Eden like, to have I've... have you get off yeah, this property. Yeah. Okay, Bill, I need a ride home. No, I just like woke up and I was like, and that was my women's studies minor in college. Thank you. 
<laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. I think so much of it is constant because we are constantly questioned about our choices. And, and it's mm-hmm. so difficult to finally be like, no, I'm making my choice. And it is. It's my choice. And it's a really good choice. And then suddenly something else comes. And it's like, if I acknowledge that, that I'm going to have to question everything I did. And I've just gotten over this hump. And I don't want to be back there again. So Andy, part of mostly the reunion, like I said, was just Teresa being Teresa. We spent too much time talking about Louis, who is very problematic, we're finding out. They even address the fact that Louis has had some very terrible accusations hurled his way. We also find out that Louis has watched all of Real Housewives of New Jersey. And he's a really big fan, but Teresa strongly believes that he is the miracle that was sent to her from her parents. Mm. They bring up this article that's going around about Louis and his exes saying that he was like extremely sexually demanding, demanding like sex three, four, five times a day, all this stuff. And Teresa like very casually and even Andy is like, well, Teresa, we were watching a cut and you were just talking about how you want a man that's going to do it with you three or four times a day. And she was like, like, haha, yeah, you're right. That is what I said. I noticed that too. I was like, what the fuck am I watching? Like the articles that are out about Louis aren't just like, he was just like a really horny guy. It's that he is an abusive, he's like a narcissist and he's abusive. Oh God. Sometimes Andy, oh Andy. <laughs> I, like sometimes I just feel like he is in this like vortex of hosting and sometimes he's not like taking a breath and taking a beat and like recognizing what, he's yeah. saying or like what the implication is for saying something like that that like good thing Louis found a woman who has the same libido and it's like that's <laughs> not the point Andy yeah, yeah. Like, that is yeah. literally not the point yeah yikes. yeah big yikes to quote Tyra Banks like we were rooting for you we were all rooting for you like I want the best for her because she's been through hell and like yeah I think it was the finale episode when they did that like super cut of Juicy Joe and like his that relationship it's like the woman has been through battle like she's been through war and it's like you want her to end up with a guy that's like good and fair and honest and loves her and learning that he's watched all of the housewives and then suddenly like knew what to say to win her over I'm like oh my god this is like a psychopath Uh, well prayers to Teresa I hope that she finds love and if it is Louis I guess and like he even showed up at the end of the reunion I was just like I don't like the it all of it just made me feel really icky it was bizarre and I'm glad that this season is over and I'm glad that we're quote unquote done with quarantine on Housewives where I Mm -hmm. because I believe most of them are vaccinated hopefully hopefully then once they start filming because they should start filming soon they do summer in Jersey so it'll happen soon and well, hopefully Jackie we'll get and some Kelly good Dodd are together vacationing, tell- taking pictures together. So, wait, what? Oh, Jackie from New Jersey and Kelly Dodd, they're together and posting pictures together. So, you guys. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I just killed Nor. <laughs> yeah, I think I have an ulcer. <laughs> Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. Jackie, what? You actually need to go and look at the picture she posted, though, because it's a carousel. And the second photo is one of the most awkward pictures I've ever seen in my life because it's the two couples and then they're both kissing each other. Like the couples, not like it's not like a <laughs> foursome situation yet, but it's just very uncomfortable. There she is. Are you into Evan? No, he looks like a Furby. Yeah, he's not. He's not my guy. And in this picture, he's very red. Okay, yeah, the second picture of the couple's kissing is very weird. It's giving me very, like, first boyfriend ever eighth grade vibes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> These are my boyfriends. <laughs> These are our boyfriends. Like, we're going to totally marry them one day. Like, it's it's like the first time you've ever kissed or something, like, vibes. Oh, no, Jackie. Well, it is what it is, I guess. I guess we'll find out what's going on there. Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. That's, that's very upsetting. I'm more upset about this than I thought I'd be. I'm sorry. I felt like I just casually threw that out. but yeah. <laughs> No, guys, this is – it's good. It's good for the content. You got a live reaction out of me, you know? <laughs> you can rarely get those anymore. Well, Chelsea, that's it for Housewives this week. Thank you so much. Tell us all about – where everybody can find you and all of the things that they should be uh, tuning into. Yeah. So you can follow me at Ono Bravo on Instagram. I do Instagram lives on 
Friday nights, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. I have the Know That guys on this Friday. We're going to be talking Roni. It's going to be a very good time. And then if you want to come over to my Patreon, patreon.com slash Bravo, I'm about to have Nora over there to just talk. I don't know what we're going to talk about. God knows because I have <laughs> nothing on the agenda. So go over there and listen to us just talk about whatever. Awesome. Thanks, guys. That's it for this week. We'll talk to you on Wednesday. Bye.